Hello everybody, I'm John. This is Strategic Investing and earlier today I had the opportunity to speak with Extract One CEO Peter Evans and I got to ask him about their recent filing of their Shell Prospectus, how things are going with the business and how he's thinking about the stock price going forward. So I thought I'd share that with you guys today and I hope you guys enjoy the interview. All right, uh, Peter Evans, always good to have you back on the channel. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, John. It's good to see you again. It's been a while since we've done one of these calls. It has. It has. It's good to be back. Good to talk to you. Um, you know, you doing you doing good. Every everything good with you? Yeah. Uh, you know, the the uh, demand on the business is continuing to accelerate, which means demand on myself, the sales staff, the support staff. But uh, yeah, I'm loving it. It's you know everything we've wanted the business to be. It's becoming and more. So that's always a good thing. That is a good thing. All right. Well, you know, just to jump into it, first things first, you guys did file a prospectus, a new shelf prospectus recently. Yep. I'm sure, you know, a lot of investors have questions. Can you just kind of talk about that? Give us some extra context around what's happening there. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. One of my favorite investors uh, who emails me frequently jumped in on that. And I always love when we see some, some misplaced assumptions. The net net of this is there are certain steps you have to go through in order to be able to raise money if you want to raise money. And even if you don't want to raise money, we filed a shelf perspective a couple of years back when I first joined the company, and that allowed us to do a raise. And think of it as the, the exchange is going and doing an analysis on your company to make sure that you are a healthy company, to make sure that you've followed the right uh, auditing procedures, financial reporting procedures, and things like this. And it's a process you have to go through in order to get approval to be able to raise more money. And that's there to protect the shareholders, okay? The exchange is looking out for the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so um, that uh, shelf prospectus has about, it was about 25 months long. It was starting to come to its end of its time and it doesn't really cost us to renew it. And the fact that we've already gone through the process, it's easier to do a little bit more due diligence and have it renewed as opposed to stopping and then having to restart again. So of course, it's a good thing to always keep it open because should we ever wish to raise money, not saying we are, not saying we're not, should we ever wish to raise money, it's there and it makes it very simple and very streamlined. We've already done the heavy lifting in terms of exchanges, due diligence on our business. Gotcha, okay. I mean, you know, I I, I did make a video on that and I think that's, that's kind of about what I was thinking. Um, a follow-up to that, you know, you guys did basically give guidance or forecast in that prospectus, does this mean that you guys are kind of gaining some more confidence around demand, starting to see some more consistent trends? Because I know you had talked about before, you know, we're not going to give guidance, give forecasts until we we see some more consistent things where we can actually give reasonable forecasts. And so is, is that what we're starting to see? You're starting to see that definitely, John. And, uh, you know, if you think about one of our last earnings calls, where we started to highlight things like our, our profitability, our, our GP for mm -hmm. the company. Um, and so as we become more and more confident in the numbers, we are going to provide those out there. And I'm really so people can model us. If you look at recently, we've had a couple of analysts come out with reports on us and we expect more of those based on the conversations that we're engaging in. And, you know, the analysts have their models. They wish to run their models, but they wish to have information. And it's always a funny thing when you give guidance. If you're uncertain, it's a lose-lose situation. You either under forecast, you over forecast these yeah. things. So you have to have the trends to be able to provide accurate forecasting. We're starting to see that now. We're starting to see more things like seasonality and what the impact of that is on our business. Okay. For example, the pro sports teams tend to uh, not purchase technology in the middle of a season. They might Makes do a sense. lot of analysis during yeah. the middle of the season, but then during the off season is when they'll start to deploy and start to prepare. Mm -hmm. So as, as you can imagine, we're having lots of conversations with Major League Baseball teams. Um, schools have a certain buying cycle. Other organizations have a certain buying cycle. So you start to see those seasonalities. So you can understand that better so we can predict this is going to be a stronger quarter. This will be a little bit lighter quarter. We know mm -hmm. what that impacts in terms of our cash flow, our revenue. Then they, we can give for, uh, forecasting and guidance to the marketplace with more confidence. Gotcha. That, that's that's all good to hear. Um, you know, a quick follow up to that as well. Not sure if you can answer this um, or comment on it, but does this guidance, does this forecasting assume that you achieve DHS designation within that time period or is or is this just, you know, leaving that to the side? Uh, the DHS is like any government entity. It's a little bit of an unknown. OK, um, we are. Gosh, I want to say if we if the DHS follows their schedule. We're weeks away from an award, but who knows if they're going to they're wow. going to achieve their schedule? Yeah, because yeah. I, I was just talking to you to an executive at Major League Baseball earlier this morning, and it took them longer than they expected, and they were committed. Mm -hmm. I've talked to others who got it in half the time. 
So it's a little bit of a crapshoot because you're dealing with the government. Gotcha. But um, the forecast itself does not include any forecasting around DHS. Okay. Okay. I mean, honestly, in, in my opinion, that's even more bullish because, you know, if that does happen, then theoretically you could have even higher guidance. Ex exactly. But again, I'd rather be a little bit more conservative. Yeah. And, no. you know, if there's anything our investors should take away, I, I tend to, you know, I get exuberant about our business. I really do think we're on a, <laughs> you know, a nice ride right now. But when it comes to those kinds of details, I'd rather under promise a little and over deliver. And exactly. if you look at the last couple of years, every milestone we've put out there, we beat it almost consistently. And that's what the marketplace mm -hmm. looks for when they're buying or, or predicting shares or they're mm -hmm. recommending shares. You know, can management execute in a predictable manner? You know, exactly. do, what, do what they say they're going to do. And so we're rather under forecast a little, take some things like DHS out. Perfect. Perfect. Um, to get into uh, the stock specifically, you know, talking mm -hmm. about that, um, obviously I would say everybody's probably pretty happy with, with how you guys performed last year, 2023. But to start off this year, you know, we're kind of going sideways. I think a question that some investors might have is how much are you actually concerned specifically with the stock price itself? And is it something that you're actively um, trying to promote or is it more so a mindset of we'll focus on the business, we'll just keep, you know, growing like we have, doubling backlog like we have, and, and eventually the, the valuation will just demand that the stock price moves up? Yeah, it's a it's. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that question, John, so bear with me. Um, first off, um, I'm absolutely focused on the stock price. Make, make no mistake, I have a whole bunch of shares and I want to see them go up. So uh, if for no, not just personal reasons, but also our shareholders, there's a lot of people who have been along this journey a long time. They put their faith in the company. You know, that's not lost on me. I have family members who have put their faith in the company and have invested in the company. So we want to make sure we do right and return the value that people expect. Um, secondly, there are some macroeconomic trends. We saw last year was a bit of a, a disaster for the stock market overall. And despite companies like us doing very well, the stocks languished. They didn't do as well as one of would have liked. Mm -hmm. The American stock market is starting to come back more aggressively. Uh, I was talking to some investors yesterday and they were talking about the number of deals since January. And you're starting to see that acceleration again. But Canada is still languishing. And as a TSA traded shares, that's that's impacting us a little bit negatively right now as a Canadian market. And if you look historically, because of the higher degree of regulations around the Canadian market, it tends to be less impacted by downsides, but it takes longer to recover on uh, the upside. Okay. okay, There's always a lag effect. And that's due to the, the tighter banking rules. Now, go all the way back to 2008. Canadian banks were not affected as significantly as American banks were because of that tightening of the rules. So I think that's that's hurt our our stock price a little bit. Coming to your question specifically about stock promotion, um, two or three thoughts. First off, my primary objective is not to be someone who's spending their time promoting the stock, promoting the stock, promoting the stock, because eventually the house of cards fall. Mm -hmm. Right. If you haven't got a solid product, if you haven't got solid profitability, if you haven't got the financial fundamentals like we just talked about in guidance, mm -hmm. right, then the house of cards is going to you know tumble down. And we've seen lots of companies who just spend all their time promoting their stock, promoting stock. Heck, in the early years, you know, before myself and others came on board, that was a little bit of what Patriot One did too. Yeah, more time, yeah. more time spent on promoting the stock. Mm -hmm at building a company. My primary focus is on building a company with repeatable, scalable growth and profitability. Having said that, now that we have marquee accounts, now that we have brand names, now that we have people like Madison Square Gardens and others who are now actually starting to go out and aggressively uh, do positive things for the company, it's a good time for us to take on more stock promotion in a judicious and selective manner. I'm not going to mm -hmm. go blank at the world with advertising to go create awareness for more institutional investors, both sides of the border. So you will see more of that, but we're going to do it selectively. We're not just going to carp upon the world with a very ad on every Yahoo page possible because that's a waste of money. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. You, you know, you, you're not going to market something until you have something to market. And exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, if people, if people put their money in based on the promotion, and then you don't meet the numbers, mm -hmm. stock tanks accordingly because the investors are like the institutional investors, for example, you know, aren't there or the 
you know, stock analysis, uh, you know, uh, reports that are coming out, you know, from the buy side and sell side analysts aren't supporting the company, mm -hmm. your, your promotion looks a little bit false. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, you know, speaking about um, a little bit more towards the business, in earnings reports, we do hear you guys talk a lot about inbound interest, you know, mm -hmm. speaking of that, that demand, uh, but from a lot of different segments and industries, you know, you guys have talked a lot about how you have focused on a specific market, but just because of the product, because of how people and customers are liking the product, you know, you've got a lot of inbound interest from other segments as well. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more uh, about the different types of customers you're seeing the most success with and maybe, you know, why those customers are, are going with you guys? Um, again, it's interesting, John, because there is a bit of a, cycl a cyclicality to that also. Okay. Uh, we're doing very, very well in manufacturing and distribution right now. And, you know, one of the key things that I found in every industry, and you see this a lot, is referenceability. It seems everybody knows everyone within a market segment. And so, for example, Kia hosted an event at their venue where um, what you'd think are their competitors, but from a security point of view, are their brethren, mm -hmm. where probably five or six other auto manufacturers were there looking at best practices. And so all of a sudden, all those auto manufacturers are calling us and saying, well, let's have a conversation. Hmm. And so, so you start to see that once you get two or three key marquee accounts in a segment, they become your references and the snowball starts to roll down the hill faster mm -hmm. and faster and mm -hmm. faster. So, you know, manufacturing distribution is doing very well for us. Healthcare is really starting to pick up for us quite nicely. Um, and we've won some, you know, it just in this last quarter, some very nice hospital organizations also on top of the ones we've announced. Mm -hmm. um, schools are taking a little longer because we got to that market a little uh, slower than others might have, but we're starting to be participants in more and more activities in the different schools. Um, and so, you know, across the board, I think almost every segment is doing well, but again, we'll see one segment's very busy for two quarters and then they're much lighter, but another segment will pick up. Gotcha. Right now, schools, hospitals, manufacturing, distribution, arenas, stadiums, live entertainment, you know, those are kind of the big four that we're getting a lot of interest and a lot of pull into. Okay. Yeah, no, I think you made a good point there. I think that's something that that really uh, a lot of people maybe might not think about with Extract One is the advantage that from a security standpoint, businesses, like you said, that would normally seem like competitors, it, it's, not a, it's not a competition to see who has the best security. In fact, you know, oh. if you want your industry to grow, you, you don't want events, bad events to happen at, at, even at other you know, your competitors' uh, uh, venues and, and yeah. manufacturing facilities and things like well, that. Exactly. And chance has it that the person who's running security at Kia used to work for a, a manager and yeah. was groomed by that manager when he worked for XYZ Automotive Company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then after he's gone to Kia, he's taken a job at Hyundai and then he's gone to Mercedes and then he's gone to Ford. And, and there's this, it's, it's funny, this group of people that all know each other so well and they share best practices all the time. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, you know, to get a little bit of back uh, back to um, you know your earnings reports and and the prospectus and things like that. Um, I know you you you've talked uh, a little bit about this in your earnings calls, and and I do uh, just by the way really appreciate uh, all of the new information that we're getting, the new way you guys are reporting, giving us you know cost of revenue margin things like that. I think mm -hmm. it really helps investors to to you know forecast and to actually value the company. Um, and it seems like one of the ways you're accounting for the hardware costs, specifically to kind of get uh, a little detailed here for the subscription contracts is by depreciating the smart gateways associated with those contracts over the life of those contracts. Yeah. Does this mean that the gateways would be fully depreciated over the initial life of the contract? Um, and just as kind of a, a follow on to that, what are you guys kind of seeing right now as as the estimated life uh, life cycle of of a smart gateway? Well, uh, let's start with the, the last question first. Um, estimated life cycle. If you look at the componentry that we used, the things that we develop ourselves, like the sensor technology, we outsource someone to manufacture it, but we we've got the IP and the innovation around that. Mm -hmm. You know, the smart gateway hasn't been out in the marketplace for ten years yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really think about it, it was post-COVID in 2021 when we started actually engaging <clears throat> people and, and shipping. So, you know, essentially it has been the longest smart gateway that's been out there has been two, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I look at the componentry itself, 
um, and how we've built it, um, I expect those smart gateways to last five to seven years. Okay. Some may last longer. Some may last a little bit shorter. Some of them, <laughs> some of them are some pretty rough and rugged environments, and um, they may not like, last quite as long. Uh, but yeah, if you think, I think a five to seven year kind of life expectancy is fairly good. So if you come back to your your question on a subscription model, and again, why I, I love subscription models is they become the gift that keeps on giving. After a period of time, you know, uh, we've broken even on the cost of selling the hardware. Mm -hmm. The ongoing recurring revenue could arguably be higher profit revenue. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it, because you've broken even already mm -hmm. and you've just got this ongoing uh, kind of stream of revenues until the end of the contract. And most customers, if you continue to deliver value to them, continue to update the technology, update the software, update the value of things like, uh, you know, our insights now labeled view platform, um, you, you, you know, continue to create more and more stickiness. So they'll repeat in the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year, the seventh mm -hmm. year, because it's part of their operations. And so, uh, you know, while we're breaking even very quickly, you know, the focus is del delivering more innovation to create that stickiness and that repeat purchase in future years. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And and I think as a follow up to that, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, and I know you, you've kind of touched on a little bit of this in your in your earnings reports, but can you speak maybe a little more to which types of customers maybe prefer um, subscription versus upfront and, mm -hmm. and maybe why they they do that? Yeah, what we see is uh, for a lot of the arenas and stadiums, they tend to purchase on subscri subscription. Very simply, if I was spending a million dollars in security staff a year, I'm using smart gateways and my cost has gone down to $500,000 of security staff, I've already had my million dollar a year budget approved and I can use those OPEX savings to pay my monthly fees. So gotcha. it's, it's a very simple model. New stadiums, uh, they tend to want to purchase on like a capital budget and they'll just put that into the FF and E of the, of the building at the building, the furniture fixtures and equipment. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but what we see, like, for example, the manufacturing companies and the schools, they tend to buy out front. It's rare that they're actually doing subscriptions. Now some do, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But the norm tends to be more upfront money because the large auto manufacturers, for example, they have the budgets. They mm -hmm. have the money. Um, oftentimes with schools, it's grant money that's been assigned to them. And they have to spend it all within a year or two years yeah. worth of grant time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're somewhat driven by their source of revenue. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. And and so, you know, that might also knowing the seasonality and what customers tend to to prefer which types of contracts is also probably going to contribute to how you guys are guiding as far as what revenue looks like. Because, you know, if you get a lot of upfront contracts, that could be a lot of actual revenue, even though in another quarter, you may get more contracts, but they're mostly subscription. Very, very much so, John. And okay. we, that's, we do see a little bit of that on a quarterly basis. We, uh, we had one quarter recently where, um, you know, we have one very large upfront contract and that bias the percentage where normally we tend to run about 50, 50, or maybe 60, 40 subscription to upfront. As far as the revenue goes. As, as far as the revenue goes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and, but then you'll start to see all of a sudden a bias the other way because of one or two large contracts that are either yeah. upfront and subscription that drive it the other way. Makes sense. So again, those are some of the things that are still working their ways out. Now, of course, as the company keeps uh, building more and more, uh, you know, customer base and more installed base, as we keep winning more and more contract, those things are going to sp start to smooth out. The mm. variability will be less as a percentage of the whole. Makes sense. Makes sense. So to sw switch gears a little bit, you know, maybe when it comes to shareholder communication and regular updates, I know you've talked many times about uh, not being able to announce a lot of your contracts at the request of customers. And, and I think that makes sense. I think everybody should understand, you know, there's a lot of customer out, out, customers out there that don't want what security system they're using just broadcast out there. So I'm not going to touch on that. But, you know, when we're talking about shareholders trying to maybe gauge the status of the business in between the regular quarterly reports, what advice would you give to them? Maybe, you know, are there key things that we should be looking at? Um, or is it just that at this point in the business, it, it's just something where it's more of a long term investment? We're not, you know, we shouldn't be focusing on the month to month. Can you maybe just touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. There's boy, there's two, three ideas there to unpack, John. So let's let's kind of knock them down one by one. The first is, you know, and almost going back to what we talked about, about stock promotion. Mm -hmm. If we were to dial back a clock four or five years, 
you know, it's the Patriot One days. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of question marks hanging over the company. Are we a real company? Is it got a real product? You know, there's we hear a lot of good stories, but is it really something there? And I think we've proven that. You know, with announcements like Madison Square Gardens, for example, you know, Madison Square Gardens, you know, took us in 24 different times to test us. On one of the prior webinars that we did, I think I might have mentioned that Darren Clapham at one point said to me, Peter, you've been here so many times, we're going to have to issue an employee badge. And, you know, our, my FSEs were there, the, the sales folks were there, many members of the tech staff were there to make sure that we passed and not only passed, but as MSG said to us, can you do this? we deliver beyond expectations. Mm -hmm. And so we've proven ourselves to be a real company, right? We've proven that we've got a real product with deployments and testing by the TSA and NCS4, and the Department of Justice and many others. We've proven it's a real product. We've proven it's a real company and we can win business. Look at the numbers from last year. So that question about press releases and information to prove that we're a real company should be gone. There's still a lot of investors who are probably still smarting a little bit from the experiences they had in the past where there was a lot of hype and no no delivery. And they're still um, kind of stuck in that mode of give me information, give me information, give me information. And I think those investors, I would encourage them and counsel them, you have to shift your mindset. We've proven that we're a real company. We've proven that we have a real product. So that question's off the table now. And the fact of the matter is, if you think about it, the evidence is, Every time we put out a press release, we put it out two years ago, all of a sudden the stock would pop 20% in a day. Mm -hmm. Now it's happened so much with such quality names that the stock barely moves. Kia, yeah. Hyundai, MSG, mm -hmm. you know, Community Health, Centera, you know, very large healthcare organization, the VA hospital, those are quality brand names. And so the stock doesn't move that much because the investment community, and particularly the institutional investors, have shifted their thinking to looking at our financial fundamentals, mm -hmm. growth rate, profitability, conversion to revenue, how quickly and things like that. And that's why we're putting out that kind of guidance. So if the retail investment community, you know, can stop thinking like retail investors and start thinking like institutional investors, they should shift their mindset from, oh, I haven't heard about the latest webinar or, you know, what Peter's eating for breakfast today. I now need to start thinking about financial fundamentals. Okay. And so, you know, is there more that we'd like to announce? Absolutely. There was one deal I was personally involved in because uh, very, very close to home. And um, it was small. It was a Fortune 50 brand name that has so much potential in the future. I would love to announce that, right? I, there's nothing more. And I find, tried every angle I possibly could to announce it. But they have a, they have a no announcement policy. None. Not even about the things they're doing themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, sometimes we're we're, we're you know, managed by the customers there's also not not much point putting out things like oh we're about to do a demo here oh we're having this conversation mm -hmm. that is not helping the fundamentals sometimes you win those demos sometimes you lose them so we'll we'll you know continue to do more of the events like we did with darren at madison square garden mm -hmm. we're going to do more and more kind of demo days and open houses and things like that and you know i hope the investment community starts to rally around things like the execution steps not necessarily the latest news release makes sense i so i if i if i understood you correctly basically what you're saying is that people should just watch my earnings videos and uh <laughs> well, earnings videos plus plus some more yes but, yes you know you know it's it's i'd say those people who are worried out like press release press release press release they're still questioning is this a real company or they're trying, trying to day trade on that and get some insight yeah information, right yeah when no, and, a certain size company it's you're you're being measured on different quality and different metrics. Exactly. Yeah. In all seriousness, no, I, I, I think you nailed it that, that it's gone from, you know, is this, is, does this product actually work? Do, do you guys do what you say you do? And now, you know, with all of the third party verification, we've seen all of the, you know, big customer names, like you just mentioned, it's hard to make an argument realistically that, ah, no, the, the product just doesn't do it because why would all of these these people actually buy the product and why would Madison Square Garden invest so much money in the company? So I think we we've shifted away from that. I think you're right, and it's more so now. Okay, what can the company do with that product, right? Okay. Um, and and so yeah, I I think I think you're right, and and I think you know we we can focus on and now I think um, investors, like I said myself, we appreciate the the new information now that we're getting 
from the financials and the gross margin and all that, because now we can shift that analysis to, okay, this is a company, this is a product that works. Where can this company go? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a really good answer there. Yeah. Um, and now my objective, again, you know, being cautious about guidance, we're doing well. You know, do I think we could double or triple again? Absolutely. Do I think we could do that again? Absolutely. If for no other reason than there's a big enough market. And now it comes down to, you know, a battle. You know, the battle is on the one side, you got the low cost provider. On the other side, you got the guy who's got deep pockets and who's buying business left, right, and center and spending money on ridiculous things to buy business. We're going to deliver a quality product with high integrity delivery around it and like white glove service to our customers. And that we'll win some, we'll lose some. But if we can keep doubling and tripling, the stock will follow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and so to kind of just wrap this up here, I, I, I think a good follow up is, is can you give us, you know, how how would you say, are there any updates, anything that you, you want to talk about right now or, or just anything else that, that, that you want to say before we go? Um, there's a lot of good things that uh, that's happening in the company right now. I really like how our innovation engine is working right now. I think we've really found our sea legs around innovation. And the more we get out, you talk about different segments. The more we get out with each segment, if you think of business strategy, you're either the low cost leader, you're the high value provider for a, a mass market, or you target individual market segments who have unique needs each. Okay. The technology itself has not shown enough differentiation to serve any specific segment very, very well. So schools look like distribution, look like hospitals, based on what the technology's limitation is, us and our competitors. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to innovate, though, so we're starting to see specialization where we're driving unique capabilities to unique segments that will make us the preferred choice. So mm -hmm. if a particular segment has an issue with steel-toed boots, and also we don't have an issue with steel toe boots, we become a natural choice for that segment. Mm. If another industry has an issue with, I don't know, uh, pacemakers, okay? The fact that the way we've designed our system that it doesn't affect those kinds of things versus other systems that are active systems that inject a signal in and will affect pacemakers gives us a unique advantage. And so yeah, people don't want to don't want to die. <laughs> no, nobody wants to nobody wants to die walking to a hospital. The last time I checked, right? So um, the um, so we continue to innovate to create that separation in terms of capabilities, so we can serve each of those segments better. And so while you know, quite frankly, we might have been later to some of those segments because our initial focus was arenas and stadiums. You can't be everything to everyone, so go do one thing really, really well. And we did that very well. And now what we're doing is we're starting to expand these other segments as they pull us with a little more purpose-built innovation that will help serve those markets much better. Makes sense. All right. Well, again, as always, thank you for taking the time, Peter. I appreciate it. I'm sure everybody that's going to watch this video appreciate it, appreciates it as well. Um, you know, I hope you guys uh, have a good rest of your, uh, I guess we're already in the next quarter. Have a good rest of your next quarter. And um, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Sounds good. John, I've got one other final closing comment that just occurred to me. Okay. You're asking about how do we give more investors more information as we're going along? Mm -hmm. Let's you and I do this more often, okay? Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, man. Right. Have a good one. Bye.